this morning, what I want to do is encourage, maybe inspire us, to take what the military has been that has given us this great country and apply it spiritually to the church that we could be used of God to establish a great church in America. Uh, there are a lot of sociologists that uh, they study religious themes in America, movements, whatever. And it is very, very popular to characterize America in the 21st century as post-Christian. Now that can happen. If it happens, it's because of our permission. Please understand that. Uh, back in 1941, we entered into a war to determine whether America would be on the right side or wrong side of what was right. We're in a war that would establish the direction of our country. By God's grace, we won that war. It was not won without self-sacrifice. Many women died in those conflicts on both sides. Many women left the comfort of their home. Can you imagine we, the volunteerism of World War II compared to today? We've actually had a president that left this country so as not to serve, not to be drafted, and yet we've had men and women who have volunteered and died because of that act of, of courage, act of heroism. We have had men and women who would turn their back on comfort, on ease, to go to a life with no air conditioning where they would walk a lot. They would be challenged physically, emotionally, and mentally every day. They would face times of sheer terror separated by times of sheer boredom and do it because they loved America and by extension because they loved you and me. I'm not sure I get it, but I'm sure grateful for it. And whether it's those who are in their 80s or 90s who served in the Second World War or those in their 20s, 30s, and 40s who have served in the current wars of Iraq and Afghanistan and others, other conflicts that we may not even remember or know about. There were acts of selflessness and courage, acts that showed that they saw themselves as smaller than something much more important. They recognized the world did not revolve around them. But if they were to do their part, it wasn't just enough to become a part, they had to become their best. And for many decades now, I've wondered why is it that that same spirit has not somehow permeated the church? At one time it did. Going back to the first century, there was a time when men and women, moms and dads, saw their lives and heritage of their children and grandchildren far more important than their own. Some could remember seeing the face of Jesus Christ. And because of that, courageously give their life for him. We literally stand on their shoulders. Does God deem their identity important? I think so. There is an entire chapter in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, we often call the Hebrews, Hebrews, Hebrews Hall of Fame. God delineates many of them and says, and time would fail of, and then just begins to mention others and others and others, and finally, and there were many who counted their life unworthy when compared to the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ, the cause of God. America can still have great spiritual days in front of her. I believe that even if the rapture catching away the church were to happen this coming year, there's still time for revival. And how dare we give up on her? The there was a town near the end of World War II called Baston. And there was a small group, I believe it was Marines, it may have been Army. They were surrounded. It was hopeless. They were running out of everything. The German Army that had them surrounded asked for a surrender. 
the commanding officer's one-word answer has rung out through the years since. He said, nuts. I'll die here if necessary. We know how it came out. They were reinforced. They won the battle. Where is that commitment in the church today? I will promise you, he didn't agree with everything his leaders did, but he understood duty and responsibility. He understood the importance of, faithful, uh, of, of preparation and faithfulness. And I believe that we need to make many correlations between our military today and what God wants the church to be if we are to be victorious. Because I've not given up on a church, whether it be this local church or the church in America. I've not given up on my brothers and sisters in Christ. I certainly have not given up on my commanding officer, my president, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. But he demands something of us. Uh, I, I was praying about this, and, and I kind of like cliches or whatever. Uh, one of the things that characterizes our military is we are, I think, the most high-tech military in the, in the world. I really do. Uh, and I thought, T-E-C, uh, I may be misspelling tech, but I'm going to spell it that way. Uh, that really describes three areas that makes a successful military. T is technology, uh, 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 excuse me, training. We've got to be well trained. Uh, you have been through a boot and then through specialist camp. Uh, you know it's not easy, it's hard, but it prepares you for the reality of conflict, the reality of battle. And we are the best trained in the world. E is for equipped. Uh, I love seeing new stuff. I, I'm kind of a techie by nature. Uh, when I heard of uh, the torpedo that will go like 100 knots, hypersonic rockets that will go like Mach 10 or something, I don't know. Uh, when I hear about uh, bullets that actually aim and they follow, what, I don't, but we've got to be equipped. Training without equipment won't help much. Uh, some of y'all remember, Bob, you remember before World War II started, that we were training our troops, they were shooting at cardboard tanks and jeeps. They really were. That's how equipped we were. When uh, Pearl Harbor happened, uh, we basically had three major aircraft carriers, three or four, that's it. We were not equipped. And good training without equipment is pretty rough to win. Got to have both. But there's also a C. Training, absolutely mandatory. Equipped, absolutely demanded. But C standing for commitment. I'm going to go and I'm going to take the training I've got, I'm going to take the equipment I've got, and I am going to win the battle. Uh, I've got a dear friend who is a submarine commander. Bill knows who it is. Uh, and something that he has shared with me that made a tremendous impact the first time I heard it at, for my life and ministry. He said, when you're in a submarine and you're underwater, you do not try to surface. You surface. You don't just try, you surface. Because plan B doesn't work. Well, we have got to get to the point to where as Christians, we don't say, God, I'll give it a shot. God, my commitment is we will do it. Reaching out. COVID has messed up a lot of our outreach, but you know what? There's something there. We will do it. Seeing God build this church through us and our commitment, God, we will do it. God, change and, and build the atmosphere where we actually value this place as worthy of sacrifice and commitment. Regular, God, we will see, God, we're not going to try. Commitment. And as Christians, we have all of that available to us. But somehow we've forgotten that as the Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, we are not only called to reign with Christ, but to suffer with him. There's a war going on. One writer said this in his comments on Ephesians uh, 3.10. It says, a true Christian described in Ephesians chapters 1 through 3, who lives the faithful life described in 4, 1 through 6, 9, can be sure that he will be involved in the spiritual warfare described in chapter 6, verses 20 through 30. The faithful Christian life is a life of battle. 
It is warfare on a grand scale. Because when God begins to bless, Satan begins to attack. He said a Christian who has no conflict is a Christian who has retreated from the front lines of service. He also, another writer also said, as believers in Jesus Christ, we are not only God's sons and servants, but also his soldiers. And a soldier's job is to fight the enemy. And there are many spiritual battles the Bible records. In Daniel chapter 10, verse 13, Daniel was praying, and the Bible says there that the messenger angel had to battle against a demon to be able to bring the message to Daniel, and then only after Michael the archangel aided him. In Jude, verse 9, Michael warred against Satan for Moses' body. In Romans chapter 1, verse 13, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 18, Paul said he had been hindered from going to Rome or Thessalonica. Those were spiritual battles. In Acts 20, verse 29 and 30, the battles within the church, within the leadership, battles, the war going on. And Ephesians chapter 6, beginning verse 10 and following, against the lying schemes of Satan. It amazes me. Sometimes I feel like uh, we're, we're like the fellow who enlisted because he gets uh, $30,000 for college and then was told he had to go to boot camp and say, wait a minute, whoa, you don't understand. I enlisted to go to college. No, if you're in the military, you're there to fight the enemy. So often we don't get it. God saves us, puts us in a grand family, the best family in all the world. He has given us a heavenly home that I can hardly wait till we get there, though I just assume not get there today. Makes no sense, but that's, that's where I'm at. But he left me here to engage the enemy. He left me here to win the battles. He left me here to fight the fight, and I pray that at the end of my life I can say as truly as the Apostle Paul did, I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, and I've kept the faith. We have battles to fight. And if we do not intend to engage the enemy, then we have no reason to be left here on earth. God left you here after he saved you to engage, to win, to fight the enemy. One last quote from uh, John MacArthur. He said this, quote, We are in a war, a fierce and terrible war, but have no reason to be afraid if we are on the Lord's side. Aspiration of that strength, excuse me, appropriation of that strength comes through the means of grace, prayer, knowledge of and obedience to the word and faith in the promises of God. War will bring many dangers. This morning I'd like us to consider several of these. And the reason that we have to understand the dangers is because, one, every one of us will face all or most of them. Number two, if we do not win the battle against these dangers that will keep us from being effective warriors, we will not be very effective. Again, as Christians, are we trained? Are we equipped? Are we committed? Are you trained or training? Are you equipped or being equipped? Are we committed and becoming more and more committed? That's the issue. An army, our army has got to be all three. Two of the three and we lose. The first danger I'd like us to look at is the danger of immaturity. We don't send children to battle something that I have been horrified over the years is the commitment of many churches against discipleship. What I have seen over the years is how many times we have folks who have been saved for 10, 15, 20 years, and yet they exhibit the characteristics of spiritual infancy. I don't have it in my notes, but in Hebrews chapter 5, 
the Bible literally says, for the time when you ought to be teachers, you ought to be mature, you ought to be a leader, you have reverted to become a babe in Christ. You're now dealing with those fundamental issues of behavior, of discouragement, of being driven by emotions and not by the Word, and all that you need to grow. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 8 uh, really uh, congeals that where it says, literally, quote, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Savior, of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. God was talking through Peter to a group of Christians, and he had to command them to grow in two things, in grace. That's the experiencing of God's power in your life. Grow in actually obeying God's word. Experiencing the reality when the Bible says in the book of Romans, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Do you want to experience abounding grace in your life? Does anybody want to experience abounding grace in your life? Then you got to go where sin abounds. You got to get out there in the battle. You've got to go out there. You experience, you experience God's grace and strength when you're where you need God's grace and strength. But if we sit back uh, in our hut, if we sit back and do nothing, if we sit back and say, God, let me watch your war going through, you'll never experience either. And if enough do that, we won't win a battle either. The war's won, we get that. But I don't want to lose even one battle. And God is telling his children to grow. Why? You don't send children to war. Satan knows where we are, where our walk with the Lord is concerned. He knows our level of maturity possibly better than we know it ourselves. He reads us. He can't read your mind. He doesn't know your heart. But he can sure read your behavior. And I can't tell you how many times churches have had to put immature Christians in areas of leadership because there's no one else. And disaster almost always follows. There's an interesting observation in the pastoral epistles. Uh, in 1 Timothy, uh, the Bible talks about pastors and deacons. You go to Titus and it's only pastors, no deacons. And if you read the book, you get the impression that maybe the reason was that uh, Titus went to Crete to be the missionary to establish a church but as it was established, there were no mature Christians who could fill the role. They hadn't grown yet. And there are a lot of comments about their emotional uh, and spiritual growth or lack thereof in the book, particularly Titus chapter 1. We need soldiers today, but we don't need children to play soldier. You know, when, when I was a kid, we used to do that. We, we grew up in a time where I guess most parents would be put in jail today. I remember I had, some of y'all may remember, a lever action Mattel carbine that actually shot plastic bullets. Anybody ever have one of those? You know how many people died or had their eye put out with them that I know of? Zero. But we did. They were spring-loaded. You put them in there. You put them in the magazine. You put caps in the back. When you shot, the hammer dropped. It went pop, and the bullet shot out for about, I don't know, six or seven feet. We played soldiers. We played cowboys and Indians. And when somebody got mad, they threw the gun down and went home. And I've just described the way a lot of Christians fight Satan. I'm just going to take my marbles and go home. I don't need this. We were going through a terrible time of struggle when I was very, very ill. Uh, and a lot of, uh, there, there were a very, very, very few very wicked people got into the church, but a lot of good folks were discouraged and left because of it. And I don't get discouraged very easily, but one of them that I really was surprised that left told me why, and his answer just broke my heart. Here's a quote. He said, I didn't, I didn't sign on for that kind of stuff. Well, wow, who does? I don't know how many of y'all were in combat. In combat, did you ever face something that surprised you? Did you throw your gun down and go home? Did you cry and ask for somebody to pat you on the back? Or did you get the job done anyway? 
We are raising a generation of wimps in our home. I'm afraid we're doing the same thing in our churches. We're almost encouraging that. Don't worry about growing up. I'll take care of you. Don't worry about being responsible. Somebody else will do it. Don't worry about self-sacrifice. Somebody else will be more than happy to sacrifice for them and you. And we're encouraging it. Guys, we're at war. And our military has given us an incredible example. I could not be proud of my army if I were German. The atrocities they committed, were, I, I, I couldn't. If I were Japanese, I could not be proud of my army and what they did in World War II. I couldn't do that. The American military, okay, we have been imperfect, but by policy, and by purpose. I'm proud of what our military has stood for and what it has done. As a Christian, I need to establish a ministry, a, a participation in these battles that other Christians would take for an example, would encourage them. Some of you here have been serving God faithfully uh, and with incredible commitment for more than just a few decades. You are an example. Tragic, I, I wish, I don't know, I, I, we have a Veterans Day and absolutely we ought to. We have Memorial Day and absolutely we ought to. Why don't we have a day when we thank God for faithful Christians? Because we sure take them for granted. I kid Bob Fifield a lot. I can do that because I think he loves me as much as I love him. He has been faithful for probably about as long as I've been alive. Not perfect. And I'm sure he would share stories about how folks have attacked him. Deloy, Lou, Jim, you're not quite old enough, but you're getting there. Others that I have known almost as long. Why don't we have a day we say, God, thank you for them? You know, God did in the Word, as I said, Hebrews chapter 11. Fox's Book of Martyrs is a book that would break your heart. Read the history of some of the first century martyrs, those who were willing to give their lives as an example of how a Christian fights the fight and wins even in death so that you and I would have a heritage that we would value. Guys, we don't fight alone and we're not the first, but Satan sure wants us to think we are. Man, I've gone this long, and we've only gotten through one of about a, two dozen verses. Guys, we've got to grow up. We've got to grow up. Ask yourself, when, when you start getting maybe tired and figure, I just, I, I, Satan is the God of disagreement, the God of divisions, the God of being a grumbler or being disgruntled. When I get that way, am I going to treat my Savior and my church like I treat my military responsibility and my country or am I going to dig in and fight for what is right I gotta grow up because adults will dig their heels in and fight children just like I said take them off and go home Ephesians 4 14 the church of Ephesus was a great church started by the Apostle Paul pastored by Timothy John was there near the end of his life but here in Ephesians 4 here is a command God gave through Paul that we henceforth be no more children. Well, that means that we stop being children. That means there were folks in the church who were behaving like children, and God was saying, stop it. Grow up. In fact, um, in Ephesians 4, 15, God actually uses those two words together. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Speaking the truth in love. There were clearly some folks in that church who needed to be soldiers, who needed to get in, the, 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 in rank and, and get out into the, the battle. But God said, first, we got to tell them some stuff they don't want to hear. And you know what the biggest problem in, in telling people that today? Well, I don't need to stand here and listen to this. I'll go to another church. Yeah. I wonder what happened. You're in the army. 
and your DI tells you something you don't want to hear. Okay? Everybody else goes to bed. That night you get dressed, you go to the Marine Corps. And you say, uh, the Army told me stuff I didn't like to hear. I, I, I want to join you. I don't think that'll work out very well. Or you go to the Air Force. Guys, that's the way you treat God. Instead of being equipped and listening with the idea, maybe I need, you know, occasionally uh, I'm told, well, that sermon wasn't all that good. Well, then I quit. No, I try to get better. Well, you're off key. No, that was him. <laughs> no, you work on it. Do we look at criticism as given to make us stronger and better soldiers? Or I just quit. I'll go somewhere else. One of the reasons we have so poorly trained Christians is Christians go where they get told what they want to hear, not what they need to hear. And 2,000 years ago, God told us that would happen in 2 Timothy chapter 4. It says, For the time will come when they will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. It's not the teachers who have itching ears. It's the people who go, what they're doing is saying, you don't tell me what I want to hear, I'll find somebody who does. And I will promise you, no matter what you want to hear, as unbiblical as it may be, you will find some preacher who will tell it to you. You will. What I'm sharing this morning is not popular, and maybe some people get upset and won't come back. But it's what will make Christians strong. It's Bible. We need to grow up. All of us do. I'm like 300 years old, and I still need to grow up. And Bob's even older than I am. Grow up. You will constantly face things that you had, did not expect. But if we have been well trained, we will figure out how to address victoriously. Lou, I didn't want to ignore you. You're one of the older guys, too. <laughs> but decades. Grow up. If it thundered through the church of Ephesus, maybe it needs to thunder through the church of the United States today. Amen? The danger of immaturity is incredible. That's the first of five I want to deal with this morning, and yet we are out of time. Uh, I think we're going to do what we did last week. I will, Lord willing, finish up this evening. Please come back. I, I don't like the clock. I know we are, in many ways, we are servants of it. I know where our online presence is concerned, we're going to drop off shortly. These are imperatives. I want to just introduce you to some of the dangers that we hit tonight. The danger of isolation. The danger of distraction. The danger of confusion. These are some of the things we will just about guarantee defeat. It will keep us from being trained, equipped, and especially committed. We've got to know where the dangers come from. We'll be addressing those. We've got to know how to, how to fight them. We will also be addressing those. Tonight at 6, I'd love to have even more people than are here now. We need this. If we are serious about changing the part of the world where we are, we have got to be better equipped than we are. And I believe God holds us accountable when it's offered and we choose not to take it. We always are a product of our choices. Let's make the right ones. Getting back to immaturity, we need to grow in grace. We do that by learning the Word of God and then by living it. By walking in faith, trusting God enough that if I obey the Word, He'll make it work. By doing and being what God wants me to do and be and trusting His blessing will be enable me to win battles and go on for his glory. But we've got to grow. And I've shared for people that uh, Bible reading, prayer, fellowship with saints, church attendance, those are four foundations of spiritual growth that for 2,000 years have been very consistent. Don't shortchange yourself in any of those areas. Daily be in the Word. Daily pray and not just now I lay me down to sleep. I, that's okay if you're a child. But put your needs, your challenges, 
open your heart out to God in prayer, you'll be amazed how God changes you and how God works in your life through it. Fellowshipping, establishing relationships with men and women uh, who can encourage you, pray for you, strengthen you, who can serve alongside with you so you avoid that isolation that we'll be looking at tonight. Church attendance, that's accountability. That's learning. That's your specialty school. You need it. How are we doing? If there's some decisions we need to make in those areas this morning, will you do that before you leave? If I can help you, if I can pray with you, if we can rejoice in a decision you have made, we invite you to come. But today, you do business with God. That's what's important. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for giving us an opportunity to be in your word this morning. And Father, for uh, these warnings or verses of equipping and strengthening and enabling. Lord, we thank you for them. Now, will we partake of them or set them aside? Will we go forth in the battle just to participate or to win? We go forth as children just until it's tough, then we just run home. Or as you commanded us in Ephesians 6, to put on the whole armor of God that having done all, at the end of the battle, we'll stand. Father, we understand the future of our country depends on your children getting trained, taking the equipment of the Word of God, and being committed so that we can stand. So, Lord, work in our hearts this morning. Begin a growth that never ends. Produce a commitment that never fails. And give us victories that are truly eternal. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.